Dr. Ben Prosser, who comes to us from the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, where he is an associate professor of physiology, as well as the associate director for the Pennsylvania Muscle Institute and the director for it's a newly established Center for Epilepsy and Neurodevelopmental Disorders. Um, it's funny because I haven't even told Ben this yet, but um, his name first came up from Dr. Jamie Smith, who put his name on the CVHR, so we have an annual cardiovascular research symposium, but I kind of hijacked you for this seminar series because I thought it was, um, and as I'll, I'll tell you about his work, um, he works in a really diverse space in biology, so I thought he was really well suited for the PBR seminar series, although I think today he's talking mostly about cardiovascular disease. Um, but yeah, so I just thought he was really well suited for the diverse audience here at the FBRI. So I first met Ben through his work on the heart um, and what he's done in the space of the architecture of the myocyte and the mechanics of the myocyte um, and the role of the cytoskeleton in these mechanics and um, how that affects downstream processes. Um, but as I mentioned, Ben also has an interest in the development of therapies for neurodevelopmental disorders, um, including antisensitive nucleotides, small molecule inhibitors, and CRISPR-based strategies. And finally, which is of interest across um, the disciplines also, he has done incredible work in the areas of RNA biology and trafficking and localized um, protein translation. So in addition, I have his CV right here, which is just riddled with awards and grants and high impact papers, but I really wanted to highlight um, what I think is great about Ben and his diversity of his research and how it's applicable to a lot of the work that we do here at the FBRI. So with that, please welcome me in, um, please well, join me in welcoming Ben Prosser. Thanks. I think I'm good. You guys can hear me okay? Wonderful. Um, thanks Jess um, for both the invite. I appreciate being stolen, that's cool. Um, and the opportunity. Um, and I've I've really enjoyed my day so far. And I'm sure like many speakers start off with that, but like I, I legitimately mean it. it. The conversations have been um, really fun. Um, I am a little bit regretful that I'm not going to talk more about the diversity of projects that we have going on. But we have this, this developing story on RNA localization, how that mediates local translation, which I think has some pretty fundamental implications for how muscle grows and, and we're going to focus on on the heart muscle today and, and you guys are going to be a bit of a test audience for a good chunk of this talk particularly the last bit which will be unpublished and so i hope you enjoy and i'm keen to get feedback and so this is this evolving story um that we've become fascinated by over the last few years which is really how, how these guys which is the microtubule network of the heart muscle cell how that acts as this sort of transit system that moves cargo around in these cells and how that cargo transport could be tuned to control where new protein synthesis occurs and by extension, how that heart cell remodels in response to stress. All right, but first I need to do the shameless plug. I am organizing the uh, Gordon Conference on Cardiac Regulatory Mechanisms, which is this June. Um, at Colby Sawyer College. If you guys have never been to a Gordon conference, first off, you should definitely go to a Gordon conference. They're great. And I really think this one is the premier one for cardiomyocyte biology. So if that's your field of interest, please join us. The uh, speaker program is available online, but there are many openings left for invited talks from the abstracts. So come and join us. Um, it's, it's, it's really a wonderful community experience at this, this conference. The other little bit of background that I wanted to touch on is this is sort of my how it started, how it's going meme, where the first five years of my lab were really all focused on the mechanobiology of the heart. And now we're doing quite a bit of work working on the circuits of the brain. This was motivated by the birth and diagnosis of my daughter with a genetic neurodevelopmental disorder. We've launched a sort of a therapeutic arm and a clinical research arm focused on uh, both understanding these genetic rare neurodevelopmental disorders and developing therapeutics for them. I love to talk about this for days. I'm not going to talk about it anymore during this talk, but if you join for the happy hour or dinner or have an interest, I'd, I'd love to, to talk about these. Uh, if you want to talk brains, just come and find me. All right, but the stars of the show for today's talk is going to be um, the mammalian cytoskeleton. And I'd just like to start with one of my favorite images of the cytoskeleton in just your sort of typical dividing cell. And I love this image, not just because it's, it's gorgeous, um, the colors work for my particular brand of colorblindness, um, but it also shows really sort of the key 
uh, uh, structures um, or, or classical organization uh, principles of the three major cytoskeletal filaments. And so that's actin, which is shown in, in gray here at sort of the leading edge of these motile cells. Um, the intermediate filaments in blue, uh, which sort of wrap around the nucleus, and then the microtubules, which we'll focus on mainly today, which tend to extend radially out from the nucleus or down here, they're performing their famous role in chromosome separation in this mitotic cell. And so this is sort of the architecture of the cytoskeleton that most cell biologists know and love. Um, and while the filaments, of course, are the same, the architecture is extremely different in a muscle cell. Please, and I'm so glad I, that you interrupted. And I wanted to say at the beginning, I love being interrupted during the talk. So, what is the roughly percentage of each filament? Of, uh, mm, that's going to be very cell type specific, and um, uh, especially with the intermediate filaments, which um, have quite a bit of cell specificity and aren't as evolutionarily conserved as actin and microtubules. Let's say in the cardiomyocyte. In the cardiomyocyte, the most abundant by far is going to be actin, sarcomeric actin specifically, which will make up the majority of the mass of the cardiomyocyte. But I'll show you images in a bit, which will give you a good, a decent amount of sense of the relative microtubule contribution. But if I had to ballpark it, and this is a ballpark based on, say, EM images, where you can see a microtubule right next to a myofilament structure, um, that um, the, the, let's say, oh gosh, Actually, it's more complicated because the microtubule length, a single microtubule can run the entire extent of a muscle cell, right? 100 microns, 150 microns in length, and how many actin filaments are going to be around there. So the actin filament number is going to be dramatically more abundant than the number of microtubules. By mass, maybe it's 50 to 1, 100 to 1, some order like that. Okay, so we are going to be focusing on these ventricular cardiomyocytes today, which are these beautiful... Uh, rod-shaped cells that are the workhorse of the heart, and we can isolate these cells from rodents, from humans, um, and they can be electrically stimulated to beat in vitro, which you see here, the rise and fall of the calcium signal that drives the contraction and relaxation of that heart muscle cell. And that contraction is occurring by the shortening of these organized actomyosin arrays that are known as sarcomeres those repeating structures that give the cell its sort of periodic and striated appearance. And I'm sure most of the folks in the audience know it's that rise in calcium causes myosin to pull on actin, that sarcomere will shorten, that cell will contract. But we're most interested in what we would call the non-sarcomeric cytoskeleton. This is the microtubules, the intermediate filaments, um, sort of the redheaded stepchildren of the cardiomyocyte cytoskeleton. And we can look at their architecture here. This is in a human left ventricular cardiomyocyte from a patient. So at the surface, you have these sort of somewhat sparse elements. They kind of wrap around the myofilaments and they're just under the muscle fiber membrane. And then as you move deeper into that cardiomyocyte, you can appreciate this sort of dense network of filaments that run predominantly along this long axis of the myocyte. And they kind of interdigitate all along the myofilaments. Now, the other key cytoskeletal element that we study is the intermediate filament desmin, which mainly wraps around the myofilaments at the level of the sarcomere, specifically the Z-disc of the sarcomere, giving it this striated appearance. And if we zoom in on just a single optical section, we see they form sort of like a lattice-like structure, right? With the longitudinal microtubules bisecting these transverse intermediate filaments. So some important background on microtubules that we're touching on a bit today. They're these long hollow tubes and they form and they grow from the polymerization of alpha beta tubulin dimers. And a critical feature of microtubules that we'll talk about quite a bit today is that they are inherently and extremely dynamic. So they can rapidly depolymerize as you're seeing here in this process known as catastrophe. The terms are very dramatic. And then they can be rescued from that dramatic catastrophe and start growing in another direction. And they do this stochastically on a time scale of seconds. Now they can also become stabilized, meaning that they sort of lose this dynamic nature and present as a more stable rod for minutes or hours at a time. And there's layers of regulation over these dynamics, which gives this network really remarkable plasticity to be able to respond and remodel in response to different cellular cues. 
Now, the critical and sort of canonical function of microtubules is to serve as the railroad tracks for cargo transport around the cell. And so these microtubule motor proteins, such as kinesin here, dynein walks in the other direction. Um, these drag vesicular cargo, entire organelles. <laughs> Siri didn't get that and she wants me to try again. <laughs> it will drag vesicular cargo <laughs> or entire organelles um, around in the cell. And I'm gonna talk about some of the, what we find to be one of the more intriguing cargos um, today. Now, this video, it's, it's cool, it's informative. It's also a complete fantasy, of course, right? No cell has ever been this spacious. Like this is a remarkable leisurely walk. Um, and these microtubules, they're also missing a key feature, um, these smooth microtubules. And, and that's these C-terminal tails of tubulin that extend out of the filament. And these are hotspots for post-translational modifications that change how microtubules interact with everything else in the cell, including microtubule-associated proteins that can stabilize them or the microtubule mo motors that walk along their length. And so you have many different post-translational modifications of tubulin, some of which are highlighted here. You also have about 18 different alpha-beta tubulin isoforms. Um, and uh, and uh, these many permutations of these PTMs, these isoforms, that makes what's called the tubulin code. And so this is how you can create sort of discrete subsets of microtubules that have discrete functions um, to satisfy the diverse needs of, of different cell types and cellular compartments. And I wanna just point out this little glowing yellow ball at the end of these C-terminal feelers, this is this terminal tyrosine residue. And this can get enzymatically cleaved um, in a process called detyrosination. And we found this has pretty important implications for the stability of the microtubule, for how it interacts with other important players in the heart and for its mechanical contribution of the microtubules in the heart. So actually our, our project on microtubules, it started like many of our projects start in the lab where we just don't understand a process and so we try to visualize it. And we wanted to know what happens to this dense network of filaments every time that heart cell is contracting and relaxing. And so this is a zoom in of microtubules in an electrically stimulated heart cell um, that's uh, been uh, uh, stimulated to beat. And this video is playing, I think at about a quarter of real speed. And hopefully you can see that these microtubules, they clearly sort of deform and they buckle in this interesting sinusoidal pattern every time that cell contracts and then they um, extend during relaxation. This was really striking behavior to us. You could imagine they almost look like spring-like elements and how this could provide some sort of pushback to myocyte contraction. And on the right is when we use this sort of custom myocyte stretcher device where we can grab and pick up a myocyte and stretch it as that myocyte would be stretched when the heart fills with blood during diastole. And at the top, you can see those microtubules sort of become taut. And you could imagine how this could resist that diastolic stretch or diastolic filling. Um, of the heart. So we were fascinated by these behaviors. We've worked a lot to try to understand the different mechanisms that govern these behaviors and the implications that it has on cardiac mechanics and function. And so to get to the newer story I want to tell today, I'm going to sum up I don't know, 10 papers worth of data in one slide, which feels so dismissive of so many people's work. But um, What we found is that microtubules can importantly contribute to the passive mechanical properties of the myocardium. Specifically, they form what's we found to be a viscoelastic resistance to the motion of the myocyte. And while this resistance is modest under healthy conditions, um, that, that mechanical contribution is graded by this post-translational detyrosination of the microtubules which cross-links them actually to the myofilaments that increases the amount of resistance they apply to those myofilaments that are trying to shorten and stretch. And this becomes quite abundant in different etiologies of heart failure. Oh, PowerPoint just blew up. Let's see if we come back. We've got the spinning wheel of death. Hmm. So how much does... Pause is a nice way to put it. 
Does the deep, is the, so is it the stiffness that leads to the deterrestination? Hmm. Or does the deterrestination? Yeah, so I guess the answer is both. So um, the deterrestination itself, we found, increases microtubule cross-linking to desmin, and desmin is wrapping around the myofilament Z-disc. So now, as opposed to having a microtubule that can kind of move more freely in the myocyte, it's now cross-linked and hooked up to the myofilament, which changes the degree of resistance that the microtubule applies to that myofilament that's trying to shorten and stretch. Does that make sense? Okay, but the, the converse to that is, well, what's driving up the detyrosination in heart disease? It's also mechanical stress. So if we take a healthy cardiomyocyte and we just put it on a substrate where we can change the mechanical properties of the microenvironment, that will pretty rapidly increase the abundance and detyrosination of the microtubule network. So we think this is a response to mechanical stress, like an, a, presumably an adaptive response in the early stage. It makes sense for a cytoskeleton to build and stabilize in response to mechanical load, but when exacerbated or prolonged in say chronic hypertension or heart failure, it can become limiting to the contractile properties of the heart cell. The actual stabilization, let's see. So how stable over time is the microtubule cytoskeleton? Yeah, so it's still, when I say stable, it's, a, it's an important question because even a, a stabilized microtubule will turn over within about two hours. So our best estimates suggest that the entire microtubule network of a heart muscle cell will break down and rebuild about every two hours. And how stable is the pattern? Sorry, I'm, oh, 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 that's actually a really fascinating question. I'm gonna show some data in a little bit where we break down the microtubule network and then we allow it to regrow and we watch it in time. It will follow the pre-existing pattern. Mm -hmm. So there are cues throughout the cardiomyocyte that help guide microtubule growth. And so microtubules, they, they essentially become stabilized in one way through what's known as a search and capture mechanism where they stochastically are sampling the environment around them. When they find something that they latch onto or bind to, it helps stabilize that structure to present as a more stable structure over time. And so we think they're following kind of guideposts in the myocyte. I'm still blown up, which means I'm gonna to have to restart. This is a great time for questions though. You guys are, you guys are helping me out here. Um, restart the program. Okay, please. So does the contractile cycling in the, the deformation and shape change of the microtubule, does that contribute or modulate cardinal transport? <laughs> yeah, um, that's actually, yeah, uh, it's a hard question to answer. Um, the, what we know is that the tyrosination status of the microtubules regulates that buckling pattern, right? So as I was saying in response to Jess's question, the detyrosination, it hooks it up to the sarcomere. If you actually measure the period of that sinusoidal buckling, the inflection points are at the sarcomere where these linkages, these cross linkages are occurring, right? If you break that cross link by tyrosinating the microtubule, then they buckle with a single long arc, right? They don't buckle in this like short sinusoidal pattern, or they'll even just slide back and forth if they're free on the ends in a contracting myocyte. Does this make sense? So the question is, how is cargo transport, which I think is a fascinating question in general, still being organized and stereotyped in a cell that's freaking doing this all the time and its microtubules are doing it. It's kind of a wild question, but we don't really have a ton of insight into. What we know is that when we change tyrosination, we do change cargo transport and properties, but we don't know if that's because we've changed the buckling and deformation pattern of the microtubules or because we've changed just how motor proteins recognize the microtubule tracks when they're post-translationally modified. Are all the microtubules anchored or are some of them not as anchored the same way? Correct, so, the, so the latter. So you, you can see some microtubules that will literally just slide back and forth. Do they have different functions in terms of, the anchor versus, they have different functions? So we think that the, this is actually a great question. So, well, because it gets, man, I'm gonna like just go on waxing philosophical for this whole hour. But, so one of the big questions is, you know, this, this thing, it's becoming an energy sink to contraction. It's impeding contraction. Why would you evolve this like cross-linked network of microtubules just to impede the motion of your myocyte? We don't think it was evolved to provide some mechanical benefit. We can propose some hypotheses. We think that the anchoring and the cross-linking is because it gets cross-linked to the sarcomere, to the Z-disc, where all sorts of cargo that microtubules deliver need to get to, right? And so we think the tethering and the anchoring is actually because that's where the microtubule is trying to direct the necessary machinery that it needs to deliver to that. And the mechanical consequence is just a consequence 
of having that nice interconnected railway system. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what do you mean? Yes. So, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. One more general question is that, you know, my cardiac myocytes have a different kind of polarity than other cells with microtubule cytoskeletons that, you know, maintain some sort of apical basal organization, which is important. Sure, I was, I was half doing computer work and half, I'm sorry, please. Polarity. Yeah. <laughs> Cardiac myocytes yeah. have a very different story with polarity. Yeah. This is a neuron or an sure, 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 sure. absolutely. Yeah, okay. For their microtubular cytoskeleton, including directionality of transport. Yes. So, is there any directionality? In no, so what's wild is, right? So, if you think about this, typically, yeah, you other cell type. Yeah, right, right. And the minus ends are around the nucleus, and then the plus ends grow out in sort of a radio organization. In the cardiomyocyte, the microtubule organizing centers aren't right around the nucleus. They're distributed throughout the myocyte at Golgi outposts. So you have microtubules nucleating all throughout the length of the cardiomyocyte. So then if you looked at the polarity, you're going to have plus ends and minus ends all so running. So, random polarity. so how this, you have an, a mixed polarity. And so how you organize this to getting certain cargo at different locations is an interesting question. What we know is overall, more plus ends are still directed towards the intercalated disc, for example. So if you manipulate the system to favor plus end directed transport and you run a simulation of all these cargos, it's inefficient because they're going to go this way, then they're going to hop to a different way, they're going to go this way, but they're eventually more going to end up here. So there's still bias to the polarity of the system that if you run the cargo long enough, you get to a different domain depending. That energetically, though, you're... Wasting a lot of time? Lot it's of a great time. question. Yeah, it's a great question. And so why do you need, why did why do muscle cells do it differently than neurons? Why not have a more efficient, uh, neurons are better. All right, we'll move on now. Is there any sort of findings on deterioration in neurons stiffness? Is that chamber specific or is that general? You know, we're all discriminatory against the right ventricle, right? And and so unfortunately, most of our work has been done in the LV and it's where we can make the most conclusions about its role and its mechanical consequences. Um, there is a little bit of work being done by Kurt Prinz's group at Minnesota on microtubule and deterrosination dependent roles in the RV and RV failure and pulmonary hypertension. And so that's emerging. It does look like there are some important consequences there. But other than that, I can't speak too much to it. We've been LV myopic, admittedly. I'll let you keep going. Yeah. Guys, this is perfect. If we don't get through my talk and we just do this, it's way more fun. So, um, okay. These are still my background slides. So, this is great. Uh, so, okay. So, I think we talked about most of these points and we actually got into more details about them, which I think is really great. Um, so, the, the, the bottom line of all this is we found that if we take uh, failing hearts, we take cardiomyocytes from patients with heart failure. They have this elevated detyrosination, this elevated stiffness. If we, through either genetic perturbations or small molecules, reduce detyrosination, we can lower stiffness, improve contractility. And so we're now partnered uh, with a couple different groups in biotech working on both small molecule and uh, genetic approaches to target this PTM for the treatment of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which are two... Um, uh, uh, etiologies of heart failure where impaired filling and impaired mechanics we think is pathogenic. And so um, that's a, a, an ongoing uh, a line of study. I'm not gonna talk about any more. Hopefully this paper will be coming out in um, Science Translational Medicine shortly um, uh, with a small molecule inhibitor of the detyrosinating enzyme um, showing some uh, uh, really um, encouraging benefit in a HEFPEF model. So. Yes, please. I do wanted to stop here, please. Uh, it's okay, really. I can. It's kind of wanted to have that there's many uh, diabetic uh, patients. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to if uh, insulin resistance impaired signaling somehow regulate or uh, the change the hyperstimulation. Yeah, um, there's actually some interesting work doing that. That's that's teased out some of the so so indeed the deterosinating enzyme is strongly regulated by phosphorylation. And some of the pathways um, that are activated in, in diabetic heart failure um, would lead to an increased activity of this enzyme that corresponds with the elevation and detyrosination that we see. Does that help it to answer your question? Yeah, okay. All right. All right. <laughs>
forgotten where I am. Okay. <laughs> so transitioning to um, uh, uh, this, this, these questions of cargo transport. And again, really, we really were thinking about the microtubules and their mechanical consequences, and we started to target them therapeutically, and we started to think about what else are we going to screw up when we target microtubules in the heart. And this got us more interested in the important um, potential cargo delivery roles that have been so well studied in that better cell type, the neuron, but which haven't really been looked at too much in the cardiomyocyte. And it, it's actually interesting to think about in the cardiomyocyte, which has these really specialized domains that have to be both built and maintained in a cell that's doing this all the freaking time and has an extremely long half-life. And uh, these are just some examples of the, the way that microtubules are delivering cargo to support these structures. The rest of the talk is gonna focus on this, how microtubules might be um, transporting interesting cargo coming out of the nucleus that we think is required for uh, regulating protein synthesis and growing the heart cell. And so some of this work was inspired by findings from our colleague Itzhak Kahat, um, who showed that the components required for protein synthesis um, whether it's mRNA, ribosomes, they weren't just restricted around the nucleus or the paranuclear ER in the cardiomyocyte, but they were distributed at the level of the sarcomere in a very evenly distributed pattern. And we wanted to know whether microtubule-based transport was helping to sort of establish this sort of local or distributed uh, translation system. And so again, we were curious, and so we just tried to visualize this. And here you're looking at a super-resolved image of a of microtubules in a healthy um, cardiomyocyte. And in orange, um, we're labeling for a, a particular RNA uh, using single molecule fish. And hopefully you can appreciate that this, this RNA is pretty well distributed throughout the cardiomyocyte. It's not particularly concentrated around the nucleus. And if you zoom in, you can really appreciate that it's very strongly associated with these microtubule tracks. You can sort of imagine how this could be trafficked sort of along these railroads. And indeed, if we fragment those railroads here with a low dose of this microtubule destabilizing agent, cortisol, um, you see that distribution sort of collapses. And now the RNAs are backed up around the nucleus and decrease as a function of distance away. And what's wild is that this isn't a finding just for a specific RNA. Here we're labeling all mature mRNA using a probe directed towards their polyadenylated tails. And now you can appreciate this rather beautiful striated distribution of mRNA in the cardiomyocyte. We consistently see enrichment at what would be the intercalated disc of the primary heart cell. And if we disrupt microtubules again here with colchicine, we see this pretty remarkable collapse of uh, mRNA backed up around the nucleus, even though the cell morphology does not change. And we can look at the time course of this effect, which I think is sort of revealing to what's going on, where when we treat with colchicine, the microtubules are essentially gonna be wiped out by this one hour time point. But at this time point, the mRNAs are still fairly well distributed, suggesting that once they get tethered to the destination, the mRNA is, is fairly stable there. But what you see is that over the time course consistent with the lifetime of the mRNA, um, you start to selectively lose mRNAs from the intercalated disc from the cytosol with a proportional buildup around the paranuclear area. So we interpret this to say that we don't think this collapse around the nucleus is those peripheral mRNAs being sucked back towards the nucleus, but instead that newly transcribed RNAs cannot get out to the periphery without functional microtubule-based transport. Something very similar is seen for the ribosomes, labeled here by probing the 18S structural ribosomal RNA. Again, this beautiful distribution of ribosomes across sarcomeres enriched at the intercalated disc, and then accumulation around the nucleus after the disruption of microtubules. And as you would expect, if you mislocalize mRNA and ribosomes, the sites of new protein synthesis are mislocalized when you disrupt microtubules. So here we're using the methionine analog that we can use with some click chemistry to label just newly synthesized peptides that were made in the last 30 minutes, for example. And so these new proteins, they look like they're being made at the level of the sarcomere, at the level of the intercalated disc, but in the absence of microtubules, they're collapsed around the nucleus and decline as a function of distance away. 
Now, this isn't just blowing up the cell. This process is reversible. And we can actually learn quite a bit from these reversibility experiments. So this nicotazole is a great drug. It's highly specific for tubulin. It can break it down. You can wash it out, and the microtubules will grow back. So what you're looking at here is a video showing the restoration of the microtubule network in an adult cardiomyocyte after washing out that drug, nicotazole. And this is some of the data I was referring to before, where these new track organization will mirror the old track organization before you treated with the drug, which is kind of fascinating. We're actually pretty amazed by how quickly the network can navigate and regrow in the cardiomyocyte. You see from the quantification, uh, after about 15 to 30 minutes, you fully reestablished your original microtubule density. Please. Susan, can, can it regrow as well if you keep it contracting? Right, because this is just static. Right? Never That's tried it. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really interesting practice. Shuffle things around. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. We, we should do the experiment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. So, what do you know about a range of RNA binding proteins that actually are regulating, interacting with the cytoskeleton? We, distribution. We, we know a decent bit. I mean, I should say actually, no, we don't. We, we know very little. What we have started to do is, because I'm going to show some data later showing that specific RNAs are enriched in particular compartments. And so what we've started to do is actually do sort of some proximity omics types approaches where we define the RNA binding proteins that are localized to particular domains. And indeed, perhaps unsurprisingly, there are sort of unique subsets of mRNAs and RBPs that are predicted to bind to those mRNAs that are enriched in particular compartments. Kind of so that kind of code is helping, and there's at least early evidence to suggest that it's distributing RNAs throughout the myocyte. Yeah, but early stages on all of that work. We had a wonderful student who is just is doing laser capture on the ICDs, the intercalated disc, to cut out about a thousand intercalated discs from a tissue section, and then you cut out a cytosolic section, and you can look at where you have enrichment in the different compartments. Okay, so we can collapse the mRNA and ribosome distributions with nicotazole. Then we wash out the drugs. It takes about 15 minutes for the microtubules to come back, 15 to 30 minutes. And then you can look at how these um, mRNA and ribosome distributions reestablish with time. I'm not going to go into the image quantification, um, uh, but essentially we can calculate sort of a fractional recovery of how much they return to their baseline organization. And you can see that say that microtubules are back after 30 minutes, the half-life of the recovery of mRNA and ribosomes is on the order of about an hour. So it's pretty quick to regrow the network to reestablish the mRNA and, and ribosomal distributions. You indicated out of failure and the microtube somehow has increased the D Hydrocytation. Yeah. I wonder about ambassador RNA under heart failure because the tube is still there. Right. But somehow transportation of this MRI is somewhat reduced or increased. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think that's a long answer. Um, and I've done a lot of them already. Um, but because it, it, it also comes back to it's there's many things that happen to the microtubule network in heart failure. So you have a more abundant network. We talked about how it's a mixed polarity system. We actually think this is actually an impediment to trafficking because you run from one microtubule right into another, you go back the other way, you go back the other way, you go, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's not as well of an organized uh, 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 transport system. You also have post-translational modifications that bias the directionality of transport. In heart failure, it's harder to say. I'm gonna show you some data in cardiac hypertrophy during sort of the adaptive growth phase where it appears that the PTMs the changes in the microtubule density are geared towards moving your transcripts to particular locations where you need to build that cell in an adaptive way. That I think we're starting to get a handful of, handful, uh, our, 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 our grasp around, I should say. Um, how the system goes wrong in heart failure is a far more complicated question. Theoretically, if you're having local translation, that actually solves part of the problem transport because of going from the central site of transport. So this is an interesting idea about having the the the, the distributed microtubule organizing centers. So at least you don't have to cover such a distance to get something from A to B. Please. Uh, in a similar regard to the first question, uh, heart failure is a chronic condition and doesn't have a sudden onset. This is a sudden onset of a toxic uh, chemical and allowing it to regrow after a washout, yeah. as opposed to a chronic exposure sure. to a pathology, um, sure. or I guess maybe chemotherapy, but a sure. chemical. Um, 
So is this uh, as translatable to the heart failure? I don't know if I would think of this as really, we're not trying to translate something to heart failure here. We're trying to understand some fundamental properties about hemol, mRNA and ribosomes get around in the cell. What I will show you towards the end of the talk is some data with more chronic models about how these things get redistributed that we think we can tie to some of the mechanisms and fundamentals we're, we're, we're seeing here. And it's a big area of future interest. But to me, I, I sort of start by like, if we don't understand, heart failure is so complicated and so complex that if we just start with a snapshot in heart failure and we say RNA and ribosomes are mucked up, it's really hard to make sense of that. So I think that we've sort of tried to take the approach of let's try to understand just the basic principles of this system so we can at least come up with some intelligent hypotheses when we see things are uh, disorganized in the heart failure setting. Does this make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So um, we talked about this. Uh, uh, that was looking at um, bulk mRNA and ribosomes. I do think another sort of important observation is that specific RNAs do appear to be trafficked to distinct compartments within the cardiomyocyte. And sometimes, but not all the time, this aligns with where that transcripts protein functions. So here are example mRNAs for really three of the distinct compartments that we see continuously occupied. And so many RNAs, especially sarcomeric RNAs like AXE1, which encodes for sarcomeric actin, they show this sarcomeric localization, the striated appearance. Now, other mRNAs, such as DSP, which encodes for the intercalated disc protein desmoplakin, it shows strong enrichment at this intercalated disc structure. And this is even more striking in tissue. Now, others, like the gap junction protein connexin 43, it's more restricted around this paranuclear region. And we think that it gets translated there, and then its protein is trafficked. Now, it's also a transmembrane protein, so there may be some benefit for going through this more classical secretory pathway. So I think this is interesting, the different layers of the code that help direct these different transcripts to different compartments, we don't really understand yet. What we do know is that each of these compartments requires microtubule-based transport, because they all collapse when you wipe out microtubules. Please. So the, um, what about the transmembrane components of the desmosome? Like, is DS, because that's so... So our initial hypothesis was that Every cytosolic ICD protein might be uh, it's have its mRNA trafficked and then be locally translated. And perhaps the transmembrane ones would follow more of a classical secretory pathway and have the protein translate. Doesn't work out that way. It's not as black and white. And we don't know yet a, a subset of ICD proteins show ICD enrichment of their mRNA and a subset don't. And it doesn't break down as black and white as transmembrane or cytosolic, which was the original guess. Channels, calcium channels. So some of the calcium channels are locally translated at the ICD, but it's not every channel. So so SCN, is it 5A? I forget, there's one that is particularly localized at the ICD, and it's indeed locally uh, translated there. We have good evidence for that. But other potassium channels that are localized to the disc are not. And we haven't figured out really what, what it is about one versus the other that would necessitate the need for local translation versus transport of your protein. Okay. So again, oh, yeah. the transcripts, they're using the same tracks. They're reaching different compartments. There must be additional layers of specificity to the system, right? Now, I do think it's important to note that for some mRNAs like DSP, it seems that its localization might be required for it to be translated. So here, Emily in the lab is using a system called this BONCAT PLA. And what this is doing, the orange spots are marking the locations of just newly synthesized DSP protein. And so similar to its RNA, its translation tends to be enriched at the intercalated disk, and that's quantified here. But if you treat with colchicine, it actually largely shuts off its translation entirely. And the few ectopic translation events you see are sort of right around um, the paranuclear region. This is not the case for every transcript, but for several, we see that unless you have proper localization of the transcript, you won't have efficient translation into protein. And these RNA microdomains, this is just to point out that they are particularly enriched in tissue. This is showing this example of the desmoplakin transcript in orange, highly concentrated, about tenfold enriched right next to where desmoplakin protein is made um, at the ICD. I'm going to speed through this a little bit now to get to some of the newer stuff. Um, this is just maybe 
this is just fun, I think, and hopefully a little bit provocative, but we've been trying for a while to directly visualize the RNA movements in muscle cells, which anybody that works on RNA localization knows that this is a challenge, and it's an even bigger challenge in primary cardiomyocytes. But recently, Jen in the lab discovered that tRNAs, or transfer RNAs, which is another sort of essential component required for translation, not canonically thought to be trafficked by microtubules, are transported on microtubule tracks. And this has given us really a nice handle to visualize these processes because we can directly fluorescently label the tRNAs and introduce them into muscle systems. So, oh no, play the video. Don't do it. There we go. Okay, so um, here you can see this, this sort of active transport of these differently sized tRNA granules um, moving up and down these microtubule tracks in this uh, in this myotube uh, cell here. And we're using this um, uh, transport system to try to understand these sort of molecular determinants. You see that nicotazole treatment completely stops and halts this transport. And at least for the tRNAs, fascinatingly, they seem to be hitchhiking on the endolysosomal system to get around in the myocyte, which I think is so cool. So here the tRNAs are labeled in pink, the lysosomes are labeled in green, and these guys literally lie right around the outside and are using this endolysosomal system to get distributed um, and achieve long range transport in the muscle cell, which I think is quite cool and we're following up on. Okay, now for the last 10 minutes, I guess I have, of the talk, I wanna talk more about how these processes could dictate sort of directional cardiomyocyte remodeling. So most in the crowd will know that striated muscle undergoes directional hypertrophy. You can make muscle cells thicker by adding sarcomeres um, in, 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 in parallel, or you can make them longer by adding sarcomeres in series. And in the heart, when this is exacerbated, this can contribute to hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy, respectively. But despite the fact that this sort of directional hypertrophy, this is sort of a central tenet of muscle physiology we've known for, I don't know, 100 years or something like that, or more probably, um, we staggeringly still don't know the answer to the simple question of how does the cell control where it adds those sarcomeres? How does it know to put them at the end? How does it know to put them at the top and the bottom? And we hypothesize that directing the translational machinery could be one component by which you could control where you synthesize new sarcomeres and by extension, how you grow your muscle cell. So to study this in vitro, we use a neonatal rat ventricular cardiomyocytes that are patterned or plated on these nano-patterned substrates that promotes their alignment, their maturation. So they look much more like a functional cardiac syncytium where we can actually ask questions about directional remodeling. And so we can treat those patterned um, neonatal cardiomyocytes with a hypertrophic agonist like phenylephrine or isoproteranol and we see those cells hypertrophy. And in this, pat this platform, that's driven mainly by an increase in length along that mechanical or topological cue. And we can block this ability for the NRVM to remodel if we disrupt microtubules, they won't hypertrophy at all, or we could just knock down the microtubule motor that transports mRNA and ribosomes, which is kinesin-1, um, which you see uh, uh, quantified here. But what I find cool is that the mRNA, the translational machinery, it seems to be distributed to sites of growth when you give that hypertrophic stimulus. So here we're looking at the transcript for sarcomeric actin or AXC1. It's normally fairly evenly distributed, but when you stimulate with phenylephrine, these transcripts move away from the nucleus and they get sort of concentrated at the ends of the cell. And you see a similar move to the periphery for ribosomes, and for the sites of new protein synthesis. Now, all that movement is blocked when you disrupt microtubules along with the ability of the cell to elongate along that axis. And, uh, that's 24 hours of phenylephrine treatment, but actually we can see the remodeling and the transcript movement. We've done now time series in, in the first three hours. So you see the mRNA start to move, and then in, at about six hours, we actually see eccentric growth. So it temporarily proceeds by a couple hours. Yeah. Um, 
So this is a good question. We have looked at this carefully in the NRVM platform. We have looked at this more carefully in the adult cardiomyocyte platform, which is in general more static. And what I can tell you is like in those experiments where we treat with nicotazole and we collapse the RNA and ribosome distribution, mitochondrial pattern at that, at that duration of treatment, I should say. If we wipe out microtubules for days and months, I'm sure we'll start to see adverse effects. But with like say a 12 hour treatment where your mRNA and your ribosomes have collapsed, your ER, your SR, your mitochondria maintain their normal organization. So it's independent of gross organellar redistribution on that time scale. Okay, so what's sort of fascinating to me is that in those, in those cardiomyocytes, which is on the left, or in, if you do this in the whole animal with phenylephrine injection into the animal, when the microtubules are disrupted, which is the colchicine treated group, the phenylephrine, it's still increasing protein synthesis just fine, right? You see this augmentation of protein synthesis here and here, but neither those cardiomyocytes nor that whole heart will grow. So the hypertrophic transcriptional program is activated just fine. The hypertrophic upregulation is activated just fine, but you've uncoupled it from productive growth of the heart. And so this leads us to think that just increasing protein synthesis is insufficient. It's got to happen at the right place at the right time to have productive cardiac growth, which we think is orchestrated through this microtubule transport. So this told us that microtubule transport was required for cardiac growth, which in hindsight doesn't appear to be all that surprising. Doesn't feel that way anymore anyway. But how could we sort of rewire this system to promote this concentric versus eccentric growth of the muscle? And again, I showed you that phenylephrine in this model, it's driving the flow of translation along the long axis and this eccentric hypertrophy. But we were intrigued by the observation that if we modestly stabilize microtubules, here with a low dose of this drug Taxol. Now we could override that topological cue of the pattern and they'd get thicker, right? So the cells would undergo concentric remodeling. And it's become more intriguing to us as we tested more and more microtubule manipulations in this platform. And we came to realize that anytime we stabilize the microtubules, whether it's pharmacologic or genetic, we would promote that concentric growth, this increase in width or thickness that you see quantified here. But conversely, anytime we destabilized the microtubules, gently, not wipe them out, but just destabilize, that we would promote eccentric growth or lengthening here. And so this was suggesting us that this microtubule stability is acting sort of as a switch to control the directionality of, of growth. And when we looked at the literature, we found a couple pieces of evidence to support this in vivo where groups had made either gain of function or loss of function mutations to a microtubule stabilizer. And one way it would promote concentric remodeling, the other way, eccentric. So what's happening to mRNA, to translation under these conditions? And it's getting compartmentalized very differently when we stabilize or destabilize microtubules. So we found that stabilization, which again is leading to concentric remodeling, it's constraining mRNA to this region around the nucleus with a marked dearth of that mRNA at the long ends of the cell, where your destabilizer is just showing the opposite phenotype, where it's concentrating the mRNA or pushing it towards the ends of these cells, and you have this dearth of signal from around the nucleus. Okay, so what's the mechanism behind this? Um, hopefully this will be my last few minutes. So we're switching back to the adult cardiomyocyte now. And Emily in the lab, she really got her first clue when she noticed that something odd was going on around the myocyte nucleus. And we're gonna be staring at the myocyte nucleus for the last few slides of this talk. So in response to this stabilizing stimulus, we see this dynamic microtubule population, which is marked here in yellow, that it's redistributed from its normal concentration at the long ends of the nucleus to now being at the top and the bottom of the nucleus. Along with that redistribution of the dynamic microtubule population, we see the microtubule motors redistribute. So again, normally they're concentrated, kinesin and dynein, at the long ends of the nucleus, and they get concentrated at the top and the bottom of the nucleus. And we can quantify this by quantifying the sort of the short axis bias 
the amount of the microtubules or the motors at the short axis of the nucleus versus the long axis of the nucleus. And you see this microtubule stabilization promotes this redistribution to the short arm of the nucleus. So what are those microtubule motors then interacting with at that nuclear membrane, at the nuclear top and bottom? So kinesin and dynein, they connect through what's known as the link complex to nuclear pores. And indeed, when we stabilize microtubules, these link proteins like SUN1, which normally again show this polarity along the long axis of the nucleus, they redistribute to the top and the bottom. The same thing happens with the nuclear pores get, or at least some of the nuclear pore components get dragged along for the ride and they redistribute from being more concentrated at the ends to the top and the bottom. And we know that an intact link complex is required for this. If we wipe out the link complex and we stabilize microtubules, the nuclear pores don't move to the top and bottom. So what's the consequence of this? Well, this dictates where the mRNA gets exported and where new translation is occurring. So here we're labeling mRNA on the left and new protein synthesis on the right. And again, you can see that with Taxol, we get this redirecting of mRNA export from primarily coming out the long ends of the nucleus to coming out the top and the bottom. And that corresponds to the sites of new protein synthesis. Please. So to, this part I always worry is going to yeah. lose people. <laughs> is that because, though, when you're saying stabilize the microtubule, mm. is that because they can't go out to the ends, or are they actually redirecting in the concentric to a different region? Or is it just that they can't go? So, I mean, are you, are you blocking export or, or sorry? Okay. Yeah, like in, so at, this is what you're seeing at baseline, but then when you give the stimulus to your neonatal where they're on the, and they go in their eccentrically hypertrophic. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And you're, you're stabilizing the microtubules. Is that just maintaining what would be like a non hypertrophic myocyte to stay in line and not grow bigger side to side? Does that make sense at all? Or are you actually redistributing the microtubules? You are redistributing the microtubules with this okay, stimulus. And so I guess maybe one thing that will help, I'm not sure if I fully wrapped my head around your question, but one thing that will help is this is very dose dependent. So if you hyper stabilize the microtubules, which basically freezes everything in its tracks, you don't get any of this redistribution. Okay, this has to be a gentle stabilizing stimulus that leads to a compartmentalization of stable versus dynamic microtubule pools. Okay, so if, and, and, and I took out the slide and now I'm kicking myself. If you high dose taxol treat, which basically just locks the system in place. Nothing redistributes. And, and then actually you just screw up all RNA transport, okay, if you high dose lock the system in place. But if you give a concentric stimuli, like phenylephrine and D also in a moment, you, you, you do redistribute. I hope that helps. Okay, so I really like this plot. It takes a moment to wrap your head around it, but this is just essentially showing how this stabilization is promoting sort of a concentric bias of both the mRNA, which is plotted on the Y axis, and a cor correlative response in translation, where normally this is eccentrically biased in the myocyte. It's primarily acting along the long axis. You stabilize the microtubules and everything shifts towards this concentric bias where the mRNA distribution dictates the axis of new protein synthesis. We can actually look at this with individual proteins. So here we're looking at the transcript for connexin 43 encoded by GGA1. You see with taxol treatment, this transcript is concentrated around the top and bottom of the nucleus. And now instead of connexin 43 being made at the ends of the nucleus, it's made at the top and the bottom, which we think is sort of predisposing how that protein can then be transported along different axes. The last slide I wanna show, and then hopefully we can have some more Q&A about this, is that yes, we do see some evidence of this redistribution in vivo. So we've used two different mouse models of concentric hypertrophy of the heart. One is with a short-term multiple injections of PE at day two and day four, where we've also characterized a lot of the microtubule network remodeling, and we published on this. Oh, I didn't put the link there, sorry. Um, and then the other is a longer um, ANG2 PE model with an osmotic mini pump. This is just quantifying that both of these models are driving concentric remodeling. You see the left ventricular mass increases, and you see an increase in the wall thickness telling you that this is hypertrophy, this is concentric remodeling and not eccentric remodeling. And when we look at mRNA and ribosomes, we see this redistribution in, in, in vivo. So again, normally looking at sarcomeric AXE1 transcript, it's biased towards the ends of the nucleus, and now you get this uh, 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 
concentric bias introduced with the different um, hypertrophic models, both of mRNA, which is shown here, and then ribosomes, which are not pictured. So our working model, I hope I didn't lose you all here at the end. I think there's still a lot to do on this, but our, our model is that upon a hypertrophic stimulus that is stabilizing microtubules, that you get this dynamic reorganization of microtubules and microtubule motors, which through the link complex is actually repositioning nuclear pores to bias your nuclear export. And that is setting the directionality of protein synthesis, which seems to correspond quite well with the directionality of cardiomyocyte growth. So what I'd say about this is this is early stages on this. I'd love to get pushback on this model. We think it might be something fundamental about how muscle decides whether to grow in width or in length, but there's a lot to do. And that's all I wanted to say. I think our general conclusions are that, I think we can say with some confidence that active microtubule-based transport provides spatiotemporal control over translation. And I would extend this to striated muscle because Eric Wang's group at Florida did a beautiful complementary study in skeletal muscle showing a lot of the same principles. And we would argue that properly localized translation and not just increased translation by itself is an important determinant of hypertrophy and that microtubule stability may tunably direct both the export of RNA as well as its transport to help bias the directionality of muscle growth. I need to thank Emily, Kata, and Jen, the amazing postdocs in our lab who are driving these local translation projects, as well as some of our key collaborators and you guys for all the awesome questions throughout. Thank you. We knew that's a lot. Oh, there's still we'll, more questions. We'll still, we're going to start. She's going to ignore you for now. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, you're next, I promise. <laughs> Not for long. Hey, Ben, great talk. So I have so many questions, but I'll try and just focus on the one that I think kept coming back to me when you were showing that your manipulations to the microtubules impacted both the RNA and the ribosome. Yeah. So because your last model really kind of focuses on kind of what it seems to me activity dependent transcription that is coupled to where it gets exported. Have you done the experiments where you block transcription and block translation and see how that impacts where the proteins are made? So I don't know if we've done the exact experiment that you want. So what we have done is we've actinomyosin and D-treated cells and then looked at how the RNA distributions change. And what we see is just that if we have, in, say we have enrichment of a compartment, the RNAs that are enriched in that compartment appear to have a longer half-life mm -hmm. than the RNAs that are maybe on their way getting to that compartment. But I, so I don't think that really answers the fundamental question that you're after. We haven't blocked translation. So the question came initially out when you were blocking the microtubules and the ribosomes and translation were messed up, but right. Why would some of those still get translated? Yeah. This is a fascinating ribosome? question, I think. Right. And so it could be the half-life of the ones that didn't require new transport. I don't have a great sense for this yet. So one of the things that we were struck by is that again, and especially when you look at just the whole heart in like a protein lysate, when you disrupt microtubules, translation is fine. Mm -hmm. Like global translation rate that yeah. doesn't appear to be compromised. But for specific transcripts, they don't get made if they're not at the right spot. Right. So sometimes if you back up the mRNA and ribosomes around the nucleus, you just see ectopic translation mm -hmm. events. And one thing that I think is really interesting about those ectopic translation events, those proteins appear to have shorter half-lives mm -hmm. than proteins that are made in the right spot. Which yeah. is this really cool model that like you have to be made at the right spot and incorporated into a complex to say protect from degradation or yeah. to stabilize well, that protein. There's just so many examples in development of RNAs that get localized require their protein there first. And so that might be a really key experiment for you to block the translation and see if the RNA then doesn't localize. Okay, I wasn't thinking about it that way. Yeah. That, we haven't done that experiment and that's a cool experiment. I think DSP is a great candidate gene mm -hmm. for that because we know like it has to get to the intercalated disk to be translated. Mm -hmm. And so we could block translation and then ask whether it can actually get there. Cool, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Sorry, it took me too long to wrap my head around your question. You answered both what? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I just think that the other one. Um, so there's a lot of instances in cardiac um, the <laughs> that the patients. So just morphologies where you get a lot of hypertrophy yeah. because there is this concentric thickening of the cardiac myocytes and not 
elongated. Yeah, sure. So I mean, have you looked to see whether or not in some of those instances where you're actually getting more yeah. genetic change, yeah. you get these yeah. shifts in the microtubules? Yes, yeah, so you do. So, so actually the biggest signal that you ever see with increased in detyrosination is in pediatric cardiac malformations. All right. So, so it it cracks, but that's correlation, of course. We haven't done any experimental work in those systems to reduce that and then ask, you know, because that, that begs the question of well, what is actually in vivo regulating microtubule stability or not to actually balance the yeah. So again, we think that we, we think a lot about this and maybe just from my background is, is in terms of the mechanical stresses and the hemodynamic load that the heart is experiencing. And we think that these are res attempted adaptive responses for the cardiomyocyte um, to compensate for different hemodynamic stresses. So if you give volume overload, mm -hmm. you add strain to the system, you get eccentric growth. If you add pressure overload, you add stress to the system, you get concentric growth. And then this becomes exacerbated in certain conditions. But So in, in that sense, the malformation would be secondary to the then biophysical force. But they would be cooperative because the, the biophysical force would, would start to drive up the detyrosination, which would promote the concentric load, which will worsen the mechanical stresses. And so this could be, you know, sending you down the wrong path, right? Where physiological growth, which is interesting, you know, physiological cardiac hypertrophy, like you see in athletes or in a healthy pregnancy, is it's not polarized. So you get a, you get a similar increase in both length and width. So the system wants to be balanced for proper cardiac function. And when we push the stress in one directionality or another too much, that's where we get problem. What online question? Oh. How do you expect drugs interfering with detyrosination to affect proliferative tissues, um, such as the epithelia? I don't expect it to do too much as long as we don't wipe out detyrosination. And so um, I, we, can, we can say this with some level of confidence, confidence because we've done now small molecule systemic um, inhibition of detyrosination by inhibiting the detyrosinating enzyme. Um, and if anything, we see healthy longevity of the animals. Now, it's important to note that our compound doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. If your detyrosinase inhibitor crosses the blood-brain barrier, you will disrupt axonal patterning and axonal transport um, and, and have pathological consequences from that. Um, but we haven't seen a real potent effect on proliferative tissues. I should caveat that by saying if you wipe out detyrosination, it affects the motors that regulate chromosome congregation and segregation, and that will screw up mitosis and proliferation. All right. I think that's all we have time for. So if you have any more questions for Ben, he'll be around all day. And just join me. In this is a great audience. Thank you, guys.